yeah. what it is. Uh, we are now joined by Jake Hatch. The Zone Sports Network covers BYU, uh, and you can hear him on uh, Locked On uh, BYU as well. This podcast, uh, Jake, always love having you on the show, and we have you via Zoom today. Uh, it's long overdue so that people can see your very handsome face uh, and get to know you that uh, they haven't seen you uh, on Zoom uh, yet before. But it's it's a bummer of a day for BYU and that they had a coach that really fit them well and took them into the Big Twelve uh, with their pick. Excuse me, pick thirteenth, and they. They rattle their way into the into the tournament, and they played so well. They beat Baylor. They beat Kansas. They beat Kansas at Allen Fieldhouse. They did a lot of great things, but now he's off to Kentucky. Where do they go from here? Uh, well, frankly, yeah, it, it's a bit of a bummer day for BYU, but I think all attention has shifted towards uh, the future because if there was one position that Mark Pope, who was a University of Kentucky alumnus, was going to chase and BYU was not going to put up much of a fight, it was the Kentucky Wildcats. So congratulations to him on getting his quote-unquote dream job. Now the attention uh, focuses, I think, on on Chris Burgess. He was uh, one of uh, Mark Pope's top lieutenants in Provo in his early run at BYU, and then uh, Burgess, who was a Utah alum, uh, went and joined Craig Smith staff at the University of Utah for the past two seasons uh, with Mark Madsen putting out a statement this morning that essentially said, I'm committed to doing what I'm doing at Cal. I think that all eyes right now look at Chris Burgess and the chance that he ends up uh, coming back south 40 miles to Provo to be the head coach to replace Mark Pope. Um, do they, because they want their coaches to be LDS, do they, do they not necessarily cast as wide a net as normally a school would? Yeah, they they have a pretty limited pool, frankly. And I, I did I put together a list of guys. I was trying to think of anybody I could think of that had uh, connections to the university, and as you mentioned, were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, which is a prerequisite. I know it's an unwritten rule, but it's a prerequisite all the same for BYU coaches. And I, I essentially came up with a list. If I really stretched it out to about ten guys, that is about as uh, as deep the pool goes for BYU to have realistic options for their head coaching position. The nice part is. As I mentioned, a guy like Chris Burgess, he's worked at BYU. He's a member of the LDS faith, so he understands the whole dynamic of how things work inside the university and the basketball program, and it seems like a pretty natural fit to slot him in. But if they have to go deeper than that, there are, are other options out there. But, yeah, it's not your typical coaching search where you may have 20, 30, 50, 100 guys that could be in the mix. They went down the road with Mark Matson before, right? They, they did. They've, they've explored Mark Madsen in the past as well, and uh, he is a guy that uh, took over from Mark Pope when Mark took the job at BYU. Uh, Mark replacing Mark, kind of funny, but Madsen mm -hmm. did a very, very good job at UVU, and uh, we had so many people out here in Utah last year when Jared Haas, when, Mark Madsen is a Stanford alum, for those people who don't know, a very proud Stanford alum, and when there were rumors about Jared Haas last uh, year potentially being fired, we had a, a slew of people tell us that, hey, watch out for Mark Madsen taking over at Stanford. Stanford, for inexplicable reasons, decided to hold on to Jared Haas for another year and ultimately fired him uh, just this earlier this, um, I guess, last month, I should say. And I don't know why, but Cal, the Cal Bear swooped in and scooped him up. Uh, Mark Madsen is living near his hometown out there in Northern California and uh, apparently is very much enjoying life. And it appears that he is set to, to stay put with Cal. And I'm sure BYU would have liked to explore maybe a little further down the road with him to see if he was interested in taking this job. But uh, uh, as it stands right now, it appears that he is going to pass on that opportunity. Uh, do you feel that the the transfer portal is about to get more full of BYU players? Well, as of you and I talking, I think their two most indispensable pieces have already entered the portal. Ali Khalifa, the big man who's a, a poor man's Nikola Jokic with his passing ability, he's entered the transfer portal, and I, I'd expect he's a guy that's a very likely candidate to follow Mark Pope to Kentucky. And then Dallin Hall, their star point guard, a guy that I thought was an indispensable piece this past year. They Frankly, when he was off the court, they struggled mightily uh, without his direction, his ability to really run their sets on offense. He's entered the transfer portal. And I feel like it's just kind of the, the quote unquote tip of the iceberg for this program. I'm expecting a pretty large number of those guys on that roster enter the portal. Now, are they entering the portal to follow Pope to Kentucky? That's to be determined. I think a lot of them may be just going into the portal as most guys probably should in the circumstance of the coaching, coaching search to see what the options are out there and then reevaluate once BYU locks in on who their next head coach is going to be. How long do you think that uh, Tom Holmo will take in this search? 
Uh, I think Tom Homo would like to have it wrapped up as soon as humanly possible. I would like, personally, I'd like to see him have it done by Monday because I think a guy like Chris Burgess could be uh, locked in as quickly as that. But the, the bigger issue is with BYU being a faith-based institution, they are governed by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, church hierarchy. Uh, so that goes goes all the way up to church leadership in Salt Lake City. And they're going to have to sign off on whoever might get hired. And in the, in the past, uh, Paul, the situation has been that uh, a lot of those uh, parties that that seem to have an influence on decisions of this uh, magnitude can slow things down. Kalani Satake was a guy that BYU zeroed in on when he was hired eight years, eight plus years ago as BYU's head coach. It took nearly a month to finally get him signed, sealed, and delivered. Now, in that era, you didn't have the transfer portal. You didn't have NIL, which I think have absolutely revolutionized how quickly you need to move on this. So I would hope that BYU can move quickly and have somebody secured by midweek next week at the very latest. Uh- because of that factor, I mean, is it, it's almost like, again, like they could, I mean, obviously yeah. it's not a prerequisite to hire somebody who's a member of the church, but given the missions and all the different things, is it one of those things where, look, you, you really like maybe need to, like, you can't really write it in, but you kind of have to have that unwritten rule. Cause you need somebody who understands what all these kids are going through and doing. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say this. There have been two assistants. Uh, so Dave Rice, uh, who was a, had been a, a college coach all over the country, was the head coach at UNLV for a time. He was Dave Rose, who's BYU's former head coach before Mark Pope took over. He was his top lieutenant. He was not a member of the LDS faith, but there was a time when Dave Rose was undergoing surgery and treatment for pancreatic cancer that Dave Rice was elevated to the interim head coaching position. Now, this was in the, uh, in the off season, so it wasn't necessarily as highlighted as it should have been, but uh, Dave Rice, understood exactly what BYU stood for, even as a guy who was not a member of the faith. Mark Pope, one of his top lieutenants this past season, has been with him his entire run at BYU, was Cody Fuger. And now, Fuger is not a member of the LDS faith either, but he's got 10 plus years of working in and around BYU. And I think if BYU were ever to break the mold and go outside of the faith to hire a coach, a guy like Cody Fuger would be that option. But uh, based on what I have heard in the last little bit, it sounds like Coach uh, Fuger is going to be joining Mark Pope in Lexington if everything goes well. All right, Jake, let's uh, let's talk a little football for a second here while we got you. We had Kalani Sataki on the show, was it early last week or? A couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago. Uh, and, you know, like they're having to, you know, start again at quarterback. They're having to do a lot of things. Uh, how do you feel year two in the Big 12 is setting up for them depth-wise in the way that uh, this roster has been reshuffled again? Well, the roster to me overall, I think, has been upgraded. I think they've got they've done a better job about getting uh, as as quality a depth as they, as they can. That's still going to be an ongoing issue for BYU. It's going to take some time to really build up what I think is a quote unquote power four level depth uh, for BYU. But I think they've done a good job across the board at trying to build that up. There is one glaring issue you already mentioned. They're starting over at quarterback here. Is it going to be the former Baylor Bear Gary Bohannon? Is it going to be the incumbent Jake Retzloff? That quarterback battle is very much ongoing. It will go on throughout the summer and it will go on into training camp and uh, I don't have a, necessarily a great feel for I, who I think is in the lead but my gut tells me it'll be Jake Retzloff who ultimately wins the job but considering he went 0-4 as BYU starter last year that does not engender much confidence in BYU because this program needs high level quarterback play if they want to succeed year two in the Big 12. Um, do you think I mean the wide zones and offense that uh, that Gary Bohannon ran and ran well uh, for a year uh, at Baylor until you know he kind of got banged up and the Sugar Bowl was uh, I I I I even said to people like during the game like Baylor's going to win this game when their quarterback plays his way to to being a wide receiver or a tight end uh, but he still played at quarterback he's still been there is his athleticism something that uh, they're going to have to take advantage of. Yeah, if he ends up winning the job, they will absolutely take advantage of it. That's the one thing that they have talked about, speaking of Aaron Roderick and the other coaches on the offensive side of the football. Gary is a very, very good athlete, and we had a chance to catch up with him when spring camp wrapped up, and we sat down with him. He, I, and uh, It was myself and a couple other reporters, and he kind of essentially asked him to lay out why he is still playing football, and he laid out that he had it ripped away from him with that shoulder injury he suffered at USF. He said he didn't throw a football for six months, and all he wanted to do was to finish 
finish his, his uh, college career on a high note. And that's why he ultimately opted to go to BYU. Now, a big reason why he picked BYU is, as you mentioned, that wide zone offense. Jeff Grimes, who installed that at Baylor and ran it with Gary, he helped Aaron Roderick. They, those two together built this offense at BYU. So the, the base, the nuts and bolts of this offense are the exact same as what Gary had been running at Baylor. So he felt very comfortable coming in. He's had to learn some new terminology and a few uh, uh, different things about how Aaron Roderick uh, runs his offense. But the nice part was he didn't have to come in and learn the, uh, this offense from scratch. He's able to step in right away and compete for that starting job the second he stepped on campus. Jake Hatch, uh, always available when we uh, when we need him. Jake, I, I love having you on the show. I love the backdrop, by the way. Did you, you. have the neon light? Because, well, we, listen, we're always looking to change things and steal ideas from people. Did you have that neon light made? Uh, so my wife found it of all things. I, I think she found it on the internet somewhere and I, she surprised me with it for my birthday a couple of years ago. And, uh, if you want a, a lead on it, I will be sure to ask her and get and pass it along to you. Yeah. That looks Garrett. Do you like that? I like that a lot. It's pretty dope. Yeah. We, we, we might need a 365 sports neon light. Yeah. Look, they're locked on Cougars. See, golly, that's, that's sharp. That's sharp. <laughs> I like, I like, I like the look. I like, it gives a nice, like it gives a nice vibe. Yep. And, you know, Emery will go to a bar and steal a, a random neon for us, <laughs> yeah, but I don't, I don't think that's hey. going to be, I don't hey, think it's going to be as effective. If you can, if you can make off with one, Hey, do, do your thing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm, 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 I'll say that. Yeah. Uh, hey, Jake, uh, uh -huh. do you, or, uh, what do you think about, uh, Salt Lake city getting the hockey team? Uh, ecstatic. I, I am frankly ecstatic. I will say this. I am still not necessarily the most well-versed guy in terms of uh, my overall hockey knowledge, but I can tell you this much. Salt Lake City is, has been dying for more pro sports in this market. There's obviously the talk about an MLB franchise down the road when, they, when Major League Baseball decides to expand. That's probably not happened until the 2030s, but Ryan Smith, the owner of the Utah Jazz, it looks like he is going to make this happen, and it could be happening very, very quickly if some of the reports were to be, to be believed about the Arizona Coyotes and their struggles about securing a, a home for themselves. So uh, it's crazy to consider that coming up uh, this October that Salt Lake City could be hosting NHL hockey, but I am all for it. I would love to have it here in Utah. Would it just be right there where the Jazz play at the arena? So, yeah, the, essentially the, the the promise between Ryan Smith and the NHL is that they, they would play in the Delta Center where the Utah Jazz play. The sight lines for the Delta Center are not great for hockey. Frankly, it was built as a uh, purpose-built uh, basketball and music venue, mm -hmm. so uh, there'd have to be some concessions made on changing the configuration of the seating there and everything. Like I said, the sight lines aren't great, but in the short term, just the fact you can get hockey here, you make do with what you got. And then obviously the state legislature up here in Utah has earmarked more than $1 billion in terms of potential money to go towards a public part, uh, private partnership to build a new arena uh, for hockey and the Utah jazz. So, uh, it looks like all signs are very positive about hockey coming to Utah. Well, that's wild. Uh, that's just wild. Well, Jake, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Paul. Have a great day. All right, you too. There we go.